Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here today. And yes, you don't have to worry about how many mince pies you've had. Uh, I've had more than you anyway. <laughs> so um, I'm delighted to share with you some of the work we've been doing to try to understand some of the science behind obesity. But first, I've got to convince you that actually it's worth us thinking scientifically about the clinical problems that we face. So, of course, we're all very familiar with the fact that obesity is rising, and it's been rising in prevalence over the last 30 years. And what concerns us most is uh, the high prevalence leads to complications for patients. Of course, we're familiar with the rise in type 2 diabetes, which is exponential with increasing BMI, cardiovascular disease. Fatty liver disease is something that I think often as diabetologists, physicians, many of us perhaps have not thought about that seriously, but is becoming a huge problem and is now overtaking alcoholic liver disease as the major cause of transplantation in many Western countries. Diabetic-related kidney disease and also obesity-related kidney disease are emerging problems. And of course, obesity is associated with many forms of cancer. I think really importantly, when we think about the medical complications, we should not, as physicians, forget the social, psychological, uh, and emotional complications of obesity for our patients. Obese people are less likely to be employed. <coughs> Obese children do less well at school, uh, let alone the problems associated with depression um, and the consequences of stigma on our patients. So when we're thinking about trying to understand why people develop obesity and whether we can do something about it, we need to understand more about what regulates weight. Now, of course, it's very clear that what's changed in the last 30 years has been our environment. We eat more. The type of food we eat is higher in calories. We do less activity at work and uh, at home. But within that environment, there's significant evidence that genes play a role in the balance between how much we eat and how much we burn. And within a given environment, it's our genes that influence where you lie on that spectrum. Many people are in the middle, but there are some people who gain a lot of weight very easily, and there's some people who stay thin regardless of their environment. And we're interested in trying to understand how our genes interact with our environment to influence the weight in people. And we do that by focusing on people who are at the two extremes of the distribution. So we have a cohort called Goose, the Genetics of Obesity Study, where we study very severely obese people, and more recently, a cohort of very thin people, where I'm pretty convinced we should try and find some answers there. So the approach that we take is we try to find the genes and the mechanisms that influence our weight, try to understand what they mean for physiology, and try to use that knowledge to find better treatments for patients. So why should we even be thinking about genes and biology when the environment has been such a strong driver for obesity? Well, there have always been some people who are much more prone to gaining weight. We know that from historical texts. Hippocrates talked about obesity. He talked about infertility, sleep apnea. Avicenna in the 12th century talked about diabetes for the first time. Of course, the good old-fashioned test of dipping the urine and tasting it. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, but we've always known that there were some people who develop obesity. And in fact, the first textbook of obesity was written by an English physician, Thomas Short, in the 1700s. So obesity is not entirely new, but what is new is how many people develop obesity. Now, the evidence that genes play a role in our weight comes from several sources. And cumulatively, what we know is that if you take any two people in this room, 40 to 70% of the variation in your weight is influenced by your genes. That's a big number. How do we get to that number? Well, we get to that number by studying families and particularly by studying twins. If you take identical twins and you look at their body weight, their fat mass and their fat distribution, you find that they have an almost 90% concordance for body weight. And the same is true even if you study twins who are separated at birth and live at completely different environments. The figure is less for diazygotic twins as it would be for siblings, but you can see that body weight is highly heritable just from this photo. How do those genetic factors work? Well, they work by affecting many different parameters. In clear-cut studies in twins, we can show that genes influence how much you eat. They influence how full you feel. People have done studies in like 5,000 sets of twins given them a fixed amount of food and measure how full people feel afterwards, and that response is highly heritable. Your basal metabolic rate is highly heritable, and how many calories you burn to a given amount of exercise 
also runs in families. Now, unfortunately, I was pretty convinced that how much exercise you choose to do was also heritable and biological, but it's not. Uh, that appears to be voluntary. Um, <laughs> one day I might disprove that theory, but um, also our response to interventions is also heritable. Very nice studies from Lee Kaplan showed that when people have bariatric surgery, specifically Rouen-Y bypass surgery in over a thousand people, that the response is very similar in people who happen to be related and completely different if you have a husband and wife in the US healthcare system who happen to have bariatric surgery. So there's very clear evidence that genes influence our weight right across the spectrum and they do so by affecting many of these parameters. Now, it's really on that background that we decided we wanted to try and use genetics as a way in to understanding how weight is regulated. Uh, and this is how we went about doing that. Um, and really, the seminal discoveries came from studies in mice. Now, because you're all interested in diabetes and obesity, you can tell this is a very obese mouse. This is the obi obi mouse. Okay? Now, these are mice that naturally become severely obese. And in 1994, Jeff Friedman in New York discovered the problem in these mice. And he worked out that these mice were missing a hormone called leptin, which is made by fat. And when you give these mice back leptin, you can restore their weight to normal. And then mice that are lacking the leptin receptor or the downstream targets of leptin are also severely obese. And these discoveries in mice were important because they effectively opened the way for understanding that we have a system that regulates weight. Now, what many of you will remember is certainly I didn't learn anything about a system for regulating weight at medical school. I learned about the reproductive system. I learned about growth. We learned about many things. There was no system, as far as we were concerned, for regulating weight. But of course, for something as fundamental as energy balance and your weight and the ability to survive, clearly there has to be a system. And really, the discovery of leptin <laughs> paved the way for us to figure out that system. What we now understand is that really leptin is a key hormone that comes from your fat and it goes to the brain. So your fat is not just there for insulation or to store extra calories as we always used to assume, but actually it's an endocrine organ, in fact the largest endocrine organ. And it releases hormones including leptin which then are secreted into the bloodstream and go and act in the brain to tell your brain how much energy stores you have. Your brain also receives signals from your gut, you'll have heard about these from Rachel, neural signals and hormonal signals that tell you that you're full after a meal. And all of that information is integrated in the brain to maintain body weight and keep it stable for long periods of time. Most people, their weight does not change dramatically if on one day you eat more, one day you eat less, and that's because we have a system to maintain our weight. So really, we went on to show that this system first unraveled in mice was relevant for people. And we did that by studying children with very severe obesity. These are two of my patients, as you can see, severely obese from a very young age. This is a one-year-old weighing 20 kilos and a three-year-old weighing 36 kilos. Developmentally, these children were normal. They had no known cause for their obesity. And we went on to show that they had a genetic mutation disrupting the production of leptin. So they were the human equivalent, if you like, of those mice completely lacking leptin. And because we knew that giving leptin back to the mice restored their weight to normal, we then started the first clinical trial giving these children injections of leptin. And as you can see, with very dramatic effects, these are the same patients 12 months after treatment with leptin. Now this was important because it proved that a single gene defect can cause obesity in people. And also it proved that leptin is necessary for the regulation of weight. And what we really now know is that leptin is the pivotal regulator of weight. And we've, we and others have then unraveled what does leptin actually do. Well, once it goes from your fat and it acts in the brain, it triggers a set of reactions that maintain energy balance. This is just a simplified cartoon here, but effectively when you get into the brain, leptin triggers one set of neurons in the hypothalamus whose function is to tell you to eat. Okay? And they express the peptide called AGRP. Now, in an animal, if you give them one shot of AGRP, you can make an animal eat more for seven days. It's that strong a signal. And this signal is there to tell us to not starve. Okay? It's a pretty fundamental pathway that we all have. Now, leptin also, after a meal, uh, sends a signal down this part of the pathway, activating POMC, proopium melanocortin, which the endocrinologists will know is the precursor for ACTH, in the pituitary, 
but this sentinel tells you to stop eating. And it's the interaction of the two on these neurons that express the melanocortin-4 receptor that regulates how much you eat and how you burn calories. Now, what we've shown is by studying patients with very severe obesity, that many of them that we've studied have mutations in this part of the pathway that normally would tell you to stop eating, and if it's not working, they overeat and they become obese. What we've learned through the study of these patients is that this pathway is there to maintain weight, but it also regulates quite subtle effects on our appetite. So one of the key clinical signs is in these children when I first saw them, is that they're very, very heavy, but they also really want to eat food. They constantly want to eat food. They're driven to eat, often a bit looking like prader willi syndrome. They're incredibly driven to eat, but they also really love food. Seeing any kind of food makes them incredibly happy, even hospital food. So, <laughs> so that's a pathological disorder of appetite. It was an important clinical observation that I first made. Now, several years later, I couldn't really understand what that meant. I knew it was odd to really like hospital food. I didn't understand what that was telling us. Okay? But actually what that was telling us, we were able to study many years later. So what we did was we looked at the brains of the children using functional MRI. So you get structure with MRI, of course, as normal. But if when people are lying in the scanner, you show them certain images, you can see which parts of the brain light up or are activated. So what we did was we showed our patients images of food versus not food as a control, and we used high and low calorie foods. And if you were a dementia researcher, you would do a memory task when you're in the scanner and you would see which parts of the brain light up by trying to test your memory. So we were testing the brain's response to food. And what we found is that in the absence of leptin, these children are very, very hungry, they like hospital food. Whenever they see any picture of food, even if it's broccoli, their brain lights up. Okay, that's again, abnormal. Um, and the areas of the brain that light up are the striatum, the nucleus accumbens. These are areas involved in reward. Often people think about addiction. Addiction is a little different, but it's the same regions of the brain that make you really want to have food or crave food while lighting up in these kids without leptin. When we treat them with leptin, that response goes immediately down. The response in the brain matches to their behavior. In the absence of leptin, we try to find a simple way of measuring their behavior. They really like cake, but they also really like cauliflower, the abnormal response. And then we treat them with leptin after seven days. I love this slide. Um, they kind of quite like the cake, but now they rate cauliflower zero out of 10, a more normalization of the response. <laughs> and I, was, I published this data in Science, which is a very, very big basic science journal. And I was really important because this is a complex human behavior, how much you like food. We recognize this clinically. This is what people call cravings, okay? These kids are obsessed with food. They really want to have food. And yet we could change that behavior with seven days of leptin, okay? And what it showed us is that something as complex as that behavior has a biological basis. So why should leptin do this? Well, actually, leptin is the physiological signal to prevent you starving for death. It makes an awful lot of sense that we should have a system that prevents us starving, okay? just as we have a system for reproduction and for immunity. And leptin is a key part of that system. How do we know that? Well, if we bring in healthy volunteers or medical students, effectively, uh, and we starve them for a couple of days, what you see is if you give them only 10% of their calories, about 200 calories for two days, their leptin levels fall to 20% of baseline. Okay? Then you allow them to eat freely, and their leptin levels go straight back up again. So leptin is incredibly dynamic, and it responds to nutritional state. You don't actually have to have lost any weight at this point. Okay? Now, what happens is, of course, with controlling their food intake, we then allow them to eat freely. And what I guessed, based on the animal studies, is basically people will overeat because you've been starving them. Okay? But according to the animal studies, you should overeat, correct it, and then stop. But actually, in people, they overeat after two days, they're within 20 calories of where they should be. I was very excited about that. But then we carried on the study, and they continue to overeat. Okay? So this is why human beings are different. We realize that we're starving, and we overeat to correct that deficit. Okay? And this is important because this is what happens with yo-yo dieting. Okay? We all know this situation clinically. People lose a bit of weight, and they regain the weight, and then invariably they overshoot. Okay? Now, we tend to sort of say, okay, well, you haven't really got much willpower, pull yourself together, surely you should do a bit better. This is normal physiology. Okay? When people lose weight, leptin levels fall, 
that fallen leptin drives you to regain the weight, you really want to have food, you crave food, this is the normal physiology kicking in. And it's really important as physicians that we understand that when we're thinking about our patients. So what have we been doing downstream of that? Well, we've realized that leptin goes and acts on neurons in the hypothalamus, and then it really triggers a whole cascade of events that go to regulate our appetite. I'm not really gonna go through all the details, but really to show you that within these neurons, we're now finding several genes which are disrupted in patients with severe obesity. This is just one example where we found mutations in a gene in many patients um, who have a, quite a complex metabolic phenotype. They're developing liver fibrosis at a very young age. They're very insulin resistant. They're, they're very obese. Uh, we made a mouse model where we have the patient's mutation in a mouse and that also becomes very obese. And in the mice we can study that the leptin signal to these neurons that are firing away is markedly reduced just by changing one gene. And this kind of work is important because it proves that genes are involved in the regulation of weight, but also it gives us potential approaches to treat our patients. We've now got a compound that we can give to these patients in a clinical trial. So what else have we been doing? Well, downstream of leptin is a really important gene called the melanocortin-4 receptor. Um, we found quite a lot of mutations. It's the commonest gene for obesity. About 5% of our cohort 1% of patients in an adult obesity clinic will have mutations that disrupt this gene. And here, this gene doesn't really affect much else. The patients are just rather big and rather heavy. And this kind of work is important for several reasons. So firstly, there's now a genetic test that can be done on patients in the NHS. And it certainly is um, suggested in clinical guidelines now for people who gain weight from a very young age. The age of onset is key. If you start obesity before the age of 10, particularly severe obesity, that's much more likely to have a major genetic driver. And this is important because when we find genes that are defective in patients, uh, it can actually prevent people blaming their families for causing obesity through neglect. And we've managed to stop some children from being taken into care because their parents have been blamed for their obesity. Uh, it's also important for treatments. After many years of work, we now have a drug that targets the melanocortin-4 receptor, causing 25 kilos of weight loss in a young adult with a genetic condition that was due to defective signaling in this pathway. And we're now finally able to run clinical trials in patients with genetic forms of obesity. So where are we going with this? Well, I think you know we've done a lot of the basic science. The aim for me has always been, can we use this knowledge to help our patients? And we thought, what other approaches could we take to use genes to find better treatments? Because we have pretty useless treatments for weight loss so far. Um, and one of the things that we thought about is what about if we look at the people who are at the other end of the spectrum, the people who can eat what they like and they don't put on weight. It took me quite a long time to feel somewhat sympathetic towards them. Um, <laughs> but then I thought maybe they could help my obese patients. That's really the only reason I care about them. Um, and what we set out to do was to identify really thin people who are well. Of course, that's the challenge because many people were unwell, had eating disorders, were exercising excessively. But this is the beauty of the NHS. We worked with our colleagues in primary care, approaching a large number of thin people through over 900 GP surgeries, and found people who were healthy but thin, and a cohort of over 3,000 people. And really interestingly, 74% have a family history of thinness. Okay? Um, and I think it was an important lesson for me in research, and I think also in clinical practice, that when these, having had a completely biased view about thin people, when we started the study, the patients wrote to me and said, I'm really glad you're looking at this. Nobody takes my problem seriously. Okay, the last person they'd expect is, is me. Um, <laughs> but actually, it was quite humbling because what they said to me was exactly the same as my obese patients say to me. I'm really glad you're looking into this. Nobody takes it seriously. Nobody cares about me. They just think I have an eating disorder. Okay? One of my patients actually finished a consultation and said, can I, can I give you a hug, Dr. Fruki? Okay. Um, because his father-in-law thinks he's a drug addict. They, people won't believe he is so thin for biological reasons. And I think that was something that changed my view, is that actually it's very easy for us to be judgmental about our patients. We're used to the obese ones, but actually here also the thin ones. And actually we just need to understand what is driving the variation that we see in our patients and be a bit more sympathetic towards them. So what are we doing? Well, what we've done is some genetic studies comparing the thin people to the obese people to 10,000 normal weight people. And what we find is actually there are signals for obesity. There are signals for thinness. 
and there are signals for weight regulation. And in a simple way, what we did was a score where we add up lots of common genetic variants and you make a score, and the score is higher in obese people and then in normal weight people, and it's very low in thin people. So thin people are thin because they have less of the genes that make you likely to gain weight, and they also have some additional genes that keep them thin. So they're thin for biological reasons and not because they're morally superior. Okay, I was very pleased about that finding. Um, and then finally, just a very, very last couple of slides I wanted to show you is how we can try to use genetics to understand the variation in the population. And we can use that knowledge to try to design new treatments that do the same thing as a genetic mutation might do. So in this particular study, we looked at UK Biobank, which is an incredibly powerful resource, half a million people who volunteered to give their blood samples and clinical information. And we looked at the MC4 receptor, our favorite gene in these people, and we found quite a few variants. But the key thing is we then decided to study all of these changes in the gene in cells. Okay? And when we did that, we found a whole spectrum of change. We found some variants that stop the receptor from working, but others that make the receptor work too much. Okay? Um, and they work in the normal pathway that we'd been studying for 20 years, but we also decided to study another pathway which no one else had looked at before. And we found that many of the mutations affected that pathway as well. Now, this was important because the mutations that disrupt MC4 were associated with obesity, which we knew from our previous work. But there were a bunch of mutations that cause a gain of function, make the receptor work too much, that were associated with protection from obesity. And then when we looked at how this was mediated, they were also protecting against diabetes. And you could see a straight correlation between how much a particular change works in cells and the BMI of the person. And then when we looked at the variants in more detail, what we found is that if you had a variant that was going through the new pathway called beta arrestin, you had a 50% reduced risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. That's pretty impressive, just down to one change in one gene. Okay? Um, and what this showed us is people also had a protection from type 2 diabetes. And then we wanted to figure out why does that happen? Well, the normal function of this gene is to tell you you've eaten enough and now you can um, stop eating. So if you have a super functioning gene, a gain of function gene, you basically feel full the whole time, you don't gain weight, you're protected from obesity and diabetes. And we can show in cells that the function of this mutated gene in the brown uh, is exaggerated compared to the normal in the black. Uh, and the reason for that is that normally the receptors stay on the surface of the cell and then get switched off. That's normal kind of endocrinology. But in this case, the mutation locks the receptor so it stays on the cell surface, keep telling you you're full, you're full, you're full, you don't need to eat. So a very simple change can activate the receptor and keep it on. Uh, and this is important because now we're proposing to try and develop some drugs that mimic that same effect and which would be safe and effective for weight loss. Okay, so really my last slide, we've shown that from genetic studies that severe obesity across the board can be viewed as a neurobehavioral disorder that's caused by disruption of hypothalamic circuits. We can prove that in certain patients where we find specific genes, but in many other patients, the same pathways are clearly disturbed. Clinical guidelines now recommend genetic testing, particularly where severe obesity begins from a very young age, before the age of five. Um, the guidelines are referenced here. And this is important because we can use this knowledge to challenge some of the stigma that our patients face I think it's important that physicians understand this science. It's important for our approach to our patients. And it's important so we can try and find treatments for the patients and get away from these kind of headlines that basically make people feel guilty for what is a complex clinical problem. So I want to finish with my message to you. Yes, we probably should eat less. And yes, we should exercise more. But if we could fix our genetic code, that would be absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Thank you.